Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for today's London Java Community event. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Abby and I work with Barry Cranford, who's the founder of the LJC. I have the privilege of hosting uh, today's event with Chris. Um, for those of you who don't know, the LJC is the uh, just one of the communities that is run by RecWorks. We currently run about 15 different tech communities. Um, RecWorks are a tech recruitment company with a massive, massive difference. We believe that recruitment really can be a force for good in the industry beyond just placing people in jobs. We have a particular focus on learning, mentoring and personal development. If people want to learn and others want to teach or share their knowledge, we are happy to connect to you through our communities and events. We see this as giving back to those we've worked with in the past, but also paying it forward to those we hope to work with in the future. To date, we have run over 700 events for engineers, developers, students, graduates and CTOs. We have run conferences, lightning talks, hackathons, all sorts. Um, in January of this year, we made our 4,000th introduction through our Meet a Mentor program. That's also free. Uh, we're really excited about that and we're looking forward to seeing where that's going to go next. As I've already said, we love to give opportunities for people to connect and this event is part of that. If you would like to know more about any of our other communities, please do get in touch with myself or Barry or Helen Lewis if you know her and we can take it from there. The recording of today's session will be available on YouTube. I will put the link in the chat later for you. Um, and uh, as we go through, if you do think of questions, uh, please do make a note of them because there will be time for Q&A at the end uh, with Chris. So he'll be able to answer all your questions uh, at the end of his talk. With no further ado, I'll hand over to Chris to hear about understanding Hotspot JVM performance with JigWatch. Over to you. Thanks very much, Abby. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Um, yep, yeah, okay, brilliant. Right, well, yes, yeah, thank you for giving up the start of your weekend uh, to come to this talk, uh, Understanding Hotspot JVM Performance with JITWatch. Um, now, I've put the slides for this talk on my website, uh, chrisucodes.com. Uh, so if you can't read the text on any of the slides, uh, there's a PDF of, of the whole slide pack available there. And uh, if you want to sort of play along at home uh, and, and use JITWatch um, while I'm talking, um, the instructions are on the first slide here. You just get clone it from that address uh, and build it with those instructions. I'm hoping to talk for about 40, 45 minutes uh, and then open up for some Q&A. Right, so um, who am I? Uh, I'm a market data developer for a company called ADVFN. We do stocks and shares prices. Um, that means my job is mostly message processing. So doing the same kind of um, thing over and over again, very quickly and lots of times. And that's the kind of uh, application where optimization can make quite a big difference. Um, I like to use the phrase, everything counts in large amounts. Um, that's my Depeche Mode song. Um, and uh, so single threaded straight line execution speed. Um, I make tools for understanding the JVM. Um, JitWatch was my first project. I've made a few more on my website and um, I'm a Java champion. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter on Chris, at Chris Who Codes, where I sort of tweet out mainly just performance related stuff. So, okay, let's get started. The amazing JVM, and it really is amazing. Um, you can write your program. Um, convert it to, uh, compile it to bytecode, and you can run it on anything from a tiny little uh, Raspberry Pi Zero all the way up to a, a massive server with terabytes of RAM, um, dozens of cores, um, and you won't need to do anything to get the best performance out of it. You won't need to do anything different from running it on that Pi uh, um, all the way up to that big server because the, the JVM um, does the performance optimization for you as it runs. Um, and that also means as the JVM improves from version to version, uh, you will benefit from all of those optimizations without having to recompile your code. You can write uh, for the JVM in lots of different languages. I uh, imagine most of you are probably uh, using Java, but also Kotlin, Scala, Groovy, Clojure, JRuby, uh, JavaScript, uh, over 50 languages in total, a mixture of object-oriented languages and functional programming languages, um, some of them strongly typed, others dynamically typed. Uh, and you get the memory management, the garbage collection, and the concurrency support uh, all thrown in for free. 
And how do we achieve uh, such diversity? Uh, how do we do anything in computer science uh, abstraction? We had a we had a layer of indirection. Um, there's a nice quote there from David Wheeler: "All problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection, except, of course, for the problem of too many indirections." And that's actually quite relevant because one of the things that can affect the performance of your program is uh, an extra level of indirection if you're um, doing virtual calls. And one of the things that Jitwatch can show you is whether or not you can optimize those method dispatches uh, in order to unlock some, some further optimizations. And we'll look at that later. So although I mentioned all of those languages, there's really only one language um, and that's bytecode. Uh, the JVM only understands bytecode. So you write your program in your high level language, uh, you use a source compiler to produce that bytecode. Um, some people might call it a transpiler rather than a compiler because it's not actually producing code targeted to any native architecture. Um, that means the bytecode is portable. Um, you, can, you can take your uh, compiled Java program, take those classes and jars, uh, and you can run them on any architecture you like. All you need is the JVM on that architecture. Uh, so what's the JVM? It's another program. Um, the hotspot JVM is mostly written in C++. Um, the JVM runs on the operating system. That's another program. Uh, and the operating system either runs in your hardware or perhaps it's running in a container environment. So it, it really is turtles all the way down. So what does bytecode look like uh, and what does it mean? Um, the name bytecode comes from the fact that there are 256 possible instructions because the opcode is represented by a single byte. Um, about 200 of those are in use at the moment, uh, although when Project Valhalla, uh, the value types um, uh, feature for the JDK uh, eventually uh, is released, uh, there'll be a few more uh, additional bytecodes to support those value type instructions. So here's a little example. Um, on the left here, you can see um, a very simple method uh, called add. It takes two int parameters, uh, adds them together and returns the result, uh, which is another int. Um, compiled to bytecode, this is what it looks like. Um, now, one thing I need to start off with is the, uh, the JVM is an interpreter. It's a, a virtual stack machine. Um, that interprets your bytecodes. So what happens in this program is you push the first parameter onto the stack, then you push the second parameter onto the stack, and then you call the, uh, the, the instruction to add them together, which um, pops those two inputs off the stack, puts the result on the stack, and then returns that to the caller. So virtual stack machine, this doesn't sound very fast. You've probably spent lots of money on hardware or on um, cloud service provision. You probably spent even more money on developers. Um, so you're expecting some, some decent performance bang for your buck. Um, but you can actually, you can write an interpreter in any language and it's simply a loop to fetch the next instruction and then to decode and process that instruction. But the bytecode interpreter inside the JVM is actually quite advanced. It's called the template interpreter. Um, and there's a very good presentation a few years back by Alex Blewett that uh, was done at the Docklands LJC. And there's a link here at the bottom of this slide. Uh, that's a really good um, deep dive into a bit more of the JVM than I'm going to go into today. So how do you make your code run faster? Um, the way the hotspot JVM does is using just-in-time compilation or JIT. Uh, so what it does is um, as it's running your profile, it's, uh, it's looking at it. It's, um, it's counting the things that happen and building a profile of the methods in your code. And it's looking for what are called hotspots, hence the name of the hotspot uh, JVM. And when it finds a method that it thinks uh, can benefit from optimization, it will take that bytecode and it will um, compile it into native code that's specific to the architecture. So if your JVM is running on um, Intel 64 architecture or ARM architecture or RISC-V, um, previously JVMs have supported Spark and MIPS and maybe some other architectures. Um, it will produce native code um, that uses, that uses the, what it knows about those processes. So if it knows that your Intel processor has got a certain feature, it will try and use that for the optimization. If it knows your ARM processor has a certain instruction, it will, it will use that. But profiling takes time and it takes resources um, that might otherwise be needed by your program as it's running. Uh, and that's in contrast to what's known as ahead of time compilation. So if you come from the, uh, the C or C++ world, you'll be used to not being able to run your program until you've compiled it um, using GCC or another uh, compiler, uh, which produces a, 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 an architecture specific binary that's not portable but you do get the full performance from the start, whereas with just-in-time compilation, uh, the program has to warm up, build a profile, make some optimization decisions, and then do those um, just-in-time compilations. 
one of the benefits of just-in-time compilation is the, the peak performance uh, can be driven by the behavior of the program at runtime. So depending on what your input data is doing, you might warm up different methods on different runs of your program, and those will be optimized. And that's not something you can do uh, with ahead-of-time compilation. And I should also mention that in Java, you can also do ahead-of-time compilation using GraalVM and the native image technology there. So what optimizations can Hotspot make? Well, there's more than 100 of them. I'm not going to go through these now, but we are going to visit some of these optimizations. But they are the kind of optimizations you'll see in a, uh, a native image compiler as well. So this is a, a block diagram of the JVM with lots of bits missing. Um, I'm not showing you the heap, garbage collectors, class loader, thread stacks, anything like that. This is really the execution engine of your JVM. Uh, so your code starts running in the bytecode interpreter. And um, if the method um, is profiled and determined that it's, uh, it's worth uh, optimizing, it will be uh, compiled by one of two JIT compilers. Within the hotspot JVM, there are two compilers the C1 or client compiler, which gives you a quick speed burst um, with some simple optimizations. And there's also the, the server C2 JIT compiler. This needs your program to run a bit longer to, um, to build more of a profile as to what it's doing. Uh, but this can give you some really advanced optimizations, including some speculative optimizations, i.e. I've seen this thing happening all the time. And I'm going to assume this, it's going to happen this way forever. And those are speculative optimizations. Um, when these JIT compilers compile your bytecode, they've got to put the resulting native code somewhere. And there's a memory region in the JVM called the code cache. And that's where the native methods are inserted. Um, you'll see there are two arrows on the diagram, one for optimization and the other for de-optimization. And the reason there is that sometimes uh, an optimization, especially a speculative optimization, can actually turn out to be false, uh, in which case the um, JVM will um, effectively throw away the, the code, which is no, which it treats as no longer um, no longer safe or, or valid, and um, that method will then go back to running in the interpreter um, until the profile rebuilds, and then it'll have another go at, uh, at compiling it in the JIT. Oh, and um, oops. Since, uh, since JDK 8, the default operation has been something called tiered compilation, where um, you get the best of both worlds. You'll warm up methods quickly in the C1 compiler, and the really important ones will be uh, fully optimized in the C2 compiler. So what triggers the JIT? Well, basically it's counting things. Um, it counts the things that happen when your process, uh, when your program is running. And the unit of compilation is a method. So it counts method invocations, but it can also count um, loop back edges. So um, in a long running loop, um, if this if this loop happens uh, to go back to the start lots and lots of times, the JIT compiler can go, this loop's running a long time. This is probably important code. I, I'm gonna look at optimizing that too. And when the JIT decides to optimize something, it creates a compilation task and adds that to a queue. So inside the JIT, you have compiler threads uh, and each thread contains a queue and each queue has tasks added to it. Um, and when those tasks reach the front of the queue, they'll be um, converted by either a C1 or a C2 compiler into native code and that code is stored in the code cache. The code cache um, is a fixed size, uh, so it can actually run out of space. Um, it can also become fragmented because when methods are removed, um, they, leave a, uh, uh, they leave a space that can be reused, but sometimes you can end up with fragmentation and holes that are too small to use by other, by other methods. And there's a process in the uh, code cache to help uh, compact and, and clean that up. Uh, since JDK 9 and JEP 197, the code cache has actually been segmented into profiled code. This is um, code which is running and still building a profile as it's running. Uh, Non-profiled code, this is code which has reached a, a full, a final state of optimization and doesn't need to be profiled anymore. And also JVM internal code, and that contains things like the template interpreter. One of the reasons the code cache might run out of space is that some applications make a lot of compilations. Um, perhaps they dynamically generate bytecode on the fly, and this can be things like maybe a full text query engine, uh, or perhaps a, a, an XSLT starsheet transformation. If you're weaving bytecode at runtime and that bytecode warms up and is JIT compiled, then you might need to uh, consider um, increasing the size of the code cache to ensure that you aren't running out of, of space for all of these uh, compiled methods, because once the code cache is full, um, no, no further compilations can happen and the rest of your methods are, are doomed to run forever in the interpreter. 
the JVM itself is um, contains a system called ergonomics, and what that does is it looks at the, looks at your execution environment at startup, either your local machine or your container or wherever you're running your JVM, and it makes decisions on what garbage collector to use, how much memory to allocate for the heap, whether or not to use tiered compilation, the size of the code cache, and how many JIT compiler threads. Um, in JDK 17, there are actually more than 1,300 different options you can tune on the JVM. And I've written a tool which is web-based called VM Options Explorer. It's available at this URL, and you can use that to look at what all those different switches mean. It's like a dictionary of, of JVM switches. In the JVM, code can actually run at five different levels. So it starts at, um, at level zero in the interpreter. Um, the next three levels are all... Um, code which is produced by the C1 compiler that includes different levels of profiling. Um, and finally, the uh, the fifth the fifth level, which is uh, known as tier four, uh, is, is the final code produced by the, uh, the C4 compiler. And in this um, column, you can see whereabouts in the code cache it's stored, either in the profiled area or the non-profiled area. Um, and if you use a tool like JITWatch, you can look at um, the, the, the path uh, a method takes in order to be fully optimized. It might be that um, it's a trivial method. It'll go straight from level zero interpreted into level one, which is a final compilation by the C1, because this code is so simple, it won't benefit from C2. Um, it might go from zero to four if it's only being compiled by the C2 compiler. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, the C3 code with the full profiling uh, machinery added to it can actually run quite slowly and if the C2 compiler is busy in order to prevent your code running at the um, tier 3 level for too long it'll do an intermediate compile at the second level before then going um, stage 3 and stage 4. What does a trivial method look like? Well, um, something like a getter. Uh, and in the JDK, I've um, created a little tool um, which produced a histogram of method sizes in the core libraries in the JDK. Um, and uh, the one that stands out is getters. They're, um, they're five bytes of bytecode each, and there's a special case in the JIT compiler for uh, knowing exactly what to do with those and compile them quickly. So what does it look like when your code cache runs out of memory? Um, this is just an example. JITWatch can visualize the free space left in the code cache, and I set it to a very low artificial value. It very quickly filled up and said, code cache full, sorry, everything else is going to run in the interpreter. Um, JITWatch can also visualize the activity of the sweeper in the code cache, so you can see when the sweeper is active, that means that um, potentially methods are being removed if they're no longer needed. So I mentioned speculative optimization, um, and these are things like, um, is a particular branch in the code taken or not taken? Maybe it's always taken, in which case you can assume that it will always be taken forever. Um, maybe it's uh, maybe you're looking at uh, a call site. So let's say you've got an interface animal, and the only concrete type you observe at that call site is a cat. So you cat, 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 cat. Um, you assume it's only ever going to be cats, um, so you compile the, the JIT compilable um, patch in the code for cat. If those assumptions turn out to be wrong, uh, you need a way of undoing that. So the JIT contains a concept called an uncommon trap. Uh, so every time the code runs, you'll quickly check that your assumption still holds. If it doesn't hold, then what you've got to do is you've got to stop executing the, nat the um, native code um, and unwind some bits and go back to the interpreted code where you can then start again and uh, maybe build a different profile next time. What that can lead to is um, deoptimization, sort of flip-flopping. Um, you might find that uh, the behavior of your code changes very quickly based on input data, and um, that can actually confuse the JIT compiler. It can go um, speculate one way, speculate the other way, speculate one way, speculate the other way, um, and eventually the JIT will give up because all of those deoptimizations and re-optimizations um, will degrade the performance of your program. So the JIT can actually say, sorry, I can't make a speculative opt optimization here. I'm going to do give up on that idea. So, how do we find out what the JIT compiler was doing? We just ask it. We say to the JVM, um, please turn on log compilation. Um, that's known as a diagnostic option. So first of all, you need to turn a special key, which is um, unlock diagnostic VM options to unlock all of your diagnostic options. If you really want to go deep and look at the actual native code that was produced by the JIT, there's another option called print assembly. Now, once you turn that on, you need to have a, uh, a binary called HSDIS or Hotspot Disassembler. Uh, I wrote a blog article recently about that. Uh, the link is uh, is there on the slide. Um, do not turn on 
log com uh, do not turn on print assembly in production your sysadmins will not thank you for it what that means is every time a native method is inserted into the code cache it will then um, take that native blob of code hand it to the external library hsdis which will de which will disassemble that into human readable large blob of text and then it will log that large blob of text so that's a very slow operation and can um, hurt performance so don't turn that on in production keep that for staging and, and development and unless you like um, pouring through megabytes and megabytes of log compilation XML, you would probably want to build a visualizer. So that's what I've done. And that's what uh, JITWatch is. So JITWatch is a tool that tells you which methods were compiled, when during the program's execution, were they compiled quickly or did it take a long time for them to warm up? How were they compiled by the C1 or the C2 or both? Um, were any methods deoptimized? Um, did any of your... Um, method calls get inlined into the call site? Um, what did escape analysis save you any heap allocations? Um, which branches were, were, were predicted? Um, were any intrinsics used? I'm gonna explain all of this stuff later. And um, and, and, and more. Um, so why would you want to use JITWatch? Um, two reasons really. One, you like learning because learning's fun. Uh, you can't call yourself a full stack engineer until you've rolled up your sleeves and really got into the, uh, the guts of the assembly uh, um, because that's what your Java program actually turned into when it executed. Um, the other reason is you're actually interested in system performance. Um, JITWatch is kind of like a magnifying glass. It's not the first tool you pick up. You probably want to use something like Flight Recorder with Mission Control or Async Profiler to give you an overall picture of where your CPU is spending its time. And once you've identified methods which are taking a lot of time, that's when you might want to bring out JITWatch and look at the optimizations made by the JIT on those methods. So two ways to use JITWatch. One, um, you load a log file from your from your real program, from your production system, um, or you can just play around. Uh, there's a feature in JITWatch called the sandbox, which is like a, a miniature a miniature IDE where you can uh, write snippets to um, illustrate various behaviors of the JIT. And with one single click, it compiles them up, it executes them with JIT logging enabled, it loads the result into JITWatch and it gives you the analysis. So if you're new to this stuff, um, I recommend you try out the sandbox. Once you've, uh, once you've uh, got a little bit more practice, um, start getting JIT logs from your real programs and loading them to JITWatch uh, and, and seeing what was, what, was, what was happening. So here's the main window, and uh, these are the two buttons you need to use, either the sandbox or open one of your own log files. If you're using your uh, log file from your own program, what you want to do is you want to also associate the sources the source code for your program and the classes and jars, uh, because that allows JITWatch to link everything together and you can then um, navigate from the assembly to the bytecode right back to a, an individual line of Java source code. So that's uh, that, that's recommended to, to configure up uh, JITWatch with your sources and classes. So we're gonna start looking at some optimizations. And the first one we're gonna look at is inlining. Um, this is known as the, the gateway optimization. Uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. So on the left, uh, we've got a method called add, uh, like you saw before, it takes two input parameters, which are ints, adds them together and returns the result. And here's an example of that add method being called. Um, now that is functionally equivalent to this line on the right, where the body of the method has just been copied to the call site. And what we've done here is we've eliminated the overhead of, that, of, dis of doing method dispatch. When you call a method, you've got to set up your parameters. You've got to find the address of where the, uh, where the, um, the called methods code is. You've got to jump to that uh, location. Uh, you've got to then um, pick up the parameters, use, the use them in, in your code. Then you've got to um, find a way to return that. Uh, so you've got to push the result somewhere, then, then that method gets returned, the result gets returned. So all of that's overhead. Um, and smaller methods, the method dispatch becomes maybe a, a proportionally larger part of the overhead. So one of the things that inlining does is eliminates the overhead. The other one is it unlocks the potential of future optimizations, and that's where the real wins are. Because by bringing important code close together, maybe you're calling a method in a loop, but if you can inline the body of that called method inside the loop, you might benefit from um, optimizations if the loop is unrolled. You might benefit from reduced heap allocations. If, if escape analysis can kick in, you might be able to eliminate um, common sub-expressions. Maybe something is done in several places and when they're all in line together, you can simplify and eliminate. So here's a very simple test program. Um, it's called Simple Inlining Test. And essentially what it does is there's a loop counts from zero to 10 million um, and it calls a method, calls this add method here. Um, it, uh, 
puts the result back in sum and it calls the method add with a constant 99. So every time we go around the loop, we're adding 99 more to sum and storing it back. Um, one thing to note here, um, I'm making use of the value sum. If I didn't make use of that value sum, one of the things the JIT is very good at is dead code elimination. Um, if it looks at your program and goes, well, I can see you're doing, I can see you're allocating a result to sum lots and lots of times, but it's a local and it's never used outside of the loop um, and before the method ends, I might actually just um, eliminate all of this code because you're never, you're never going to use it. You're never going to see a result from it. So if you are um, trying to do your own benchmarking, I would recommend using a tool which has support for um, avoiding dead code elimination, which might trick you. Um, so if you're using Java, Java Micro Benchmarking Harness, JMH, that has the concept of a, a black hole. And a black hole is something you can pass a result into so that the JIT doesn't um, dead code eliminate the code which produced that, uh, that result. Uh, here's the, the sandbox configuration. Uh, there's a few parameters here for controlling the JIT, but you can also see that the sandbox can also be used to execute um, little examples in other JVM languages. So here is the out, here is the result uh, in the main window of what happened when I ran that program and the JIT optimized it. I can see here that the add method and the, the constructor method, which is where it all started from, uh, were both uh, JIT compiled. And I'm focusing on the con constructor method here. I can see it was inlined twice, uh, once by the C1 compiler, which produced um, 1,080 bytes of native code. But then it was um, compiled again by the C2 compiler, and it produced a much smaller amount of native code. So there's obviously a, a clever trick it found in the more advanced server compiler. Another thing you'll notice, all of this happened in less than 100 milliseconds of execution. So um, Yes, it's a very simple program, but the JIT kicked in very quickly uh, and produced a, a very nice, well-optimized um, version of this code. So this is a screen in JITWatch called the TriView, uh, and what it does, it associates your source code program, uh, the corresponding bytecode, and the uh, if you if you have um, HS Dis um, available, which uh, JITWatch will download for you. If you don't. This is the disassembled assembly for the for the for so from this Java source code. This is actually the um, the assembly of the machine code uh, that was produced on Intel architecture. You can hover over any of these byte codes, and you get a little tooltip popping up. Um, and here, the call to add uh, is an invoke virtual byte code, um, and the tooltip says yes, this method was inline because it was hot. Um, we're looking at the the C2 method here, the um, the really clever one. In the source code, you can see. And we're adding 99, and 99 is um, 63 in hexadecimal. The uh, the assembly contains um, all the literals are in hexadecimal. So you can see here, here's the 99 being added, but it's not actually being added at all. It's actually using a multiplication instruction. So what the JIT has done is been clever enough to notice you're doing the same thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple arithmetic operation. It's an add that's happening lots of times in a loop. It's reduced that to a multiply, so you're going to get less loop iterations, um, and your program is going to execute even faster. Oh, and if you double click on any bytecode in the bytecode pane, it will bring up the browser um, for the, the JVM spec. So you can actually see what does each bytecode mean. So you can learn a bit of bytecode at the same time. So inlining sounds great. Why wouldn't you want to do it all the time? Well, you'll just end up with a massive ball of everything inlined into everything else. And that won't help. That won't actually help your performance at all. It will um, not play nicely with your instruction cache in your CPU, which likes um, the hot code to be nice and small. Um, so the JVM, the, JD, yeah, the JVM imposes limits. Um, if a method is less than 35 bytes of bytecode in size, it will always be inlined. You can control that um, parameter with this uh, switch. If it's less than 325 bytes of bytecode, which is actually a lot of bytecode, you can write a lot of source code um, that, that um, compiles down to 325 bytes of bytecode. Uh, if it's less than 325 bytes and it's hot, it will also be inlined. Uh, you can control that parameter with, with this switch. JITWatch will tell you where inlining failed, uh, what were the different failure modes? Um, it might be things like um, the method was too big. And if it was a hot method and that was too big, that's a that's a red flag. Uh, that's something that's worth your attention as a, as, as a performance interested engineer. This method was important. It was executed lots of times according to the profile built by the JIT, but it couldn't be inlined into its call site. So not only did it not um, manage to eliminate the method dispatch overhead, it also missed out on all those gateway optimizations. So um, if you see this, 
in the uh, in the JITWatch top list. Um, that's an indication to go and find those hot method two bigs and take a look at them. If you can break you can break the method up so that parts of it can be in line, you might find um, surprising performance improvements. JITWatch also has a suggestion tool which tells you pretty much the same thing. Uh, it just gives you a list uh, in text form. These are all the methods that were too big and they were hot, um, and you can just jump to them in the try view with that button. There's also a visualizer for call chains. This is from a different example uh, where method A1 calls A2, calls A3, calls A4, calls big method, which is deliberately too large. And it says, nope, didn't inline big method, too big. Too big isn't the only reason for inline failures. Uh, too deep can also be uh, a method, method for inlining failures. If, um, if you're making very, very deep call chains, uh, up until JDK 11, the maximum inlining depth was nine methods. Uh, after JDK 11, it's been increased to 15. Uh, part of JITWatch is a tool called um, JARSCAN. This is a, a static analysis tool. So this doesn't use a JIT logs. This just looks at JAR files. And it looks at JAR files and it can tell you which ones have got methods which are too big to be inlined. Um, so one of the things you might want to do with this is look at your third party libraries you're using. And if there are any methods you're calling which are too big to be inlined, this can tell you statically. Uh, three and a half thousand methods in the JDK are too big to be inlined. Most of them are things you wouldn't find in hot code. Maybe things like um, swing UE constructors are um, traditionally very large. String.split, you might call it a lot, but you can expect that to be large. It's doing regex. Um, String.2 uppercase and two lowercase. Now, that, those are very common methods um, with, a, with a wide range of use cases. How come those are too big uh, to be inlined? You might think it's quite a simple operation, changing from the upper to the lower case of a character. Well, it is in most cases. If you're uh, if you're in the ASCII world, um, it's a very simple operation. But the JDK is built for everyone. The core libraries are built for everyone. So, um, so your two uppercase and two lowercase need to work on every single locale. Um, so if you're in a German locale, you might find a sharp B, the uppercase B. When you convert that to a lowercase B, you're converting it. It becomes two characters. It becomes two lowercase S's. So the size of the underlying char array can change when you're going from upper and lower case. And all of that machinery needed to support that, that flexibility can make a method too big for inlining. So let's just say you're working um, with um, sort of warehouse SKUs and you know that those are all going to be ASCII, but people can, people can enter them in upper or lower case. So you need a method to turn them all into uppercase. This is an example of how you convert a lowercase letter into an uppercase letter. Uh, if you know they're ASCII, you can just subtract 32 because the two different alphabets are 32 spaces apart in the, the ASCII character set. And this is 69 bytes of bytecode. And using a JMH benchmark, you can see that uh, the, the customized version using only ASCII does more than twice the operations per second. And the point I'm trying to illustrate, illustrate here is you can use domain knowledge. You can use knowledge of the domain you're operating in. If you know you're only using ASCII, if you know you're only using numbers in a certain range, um, use knowledge of your domain to drive your program's design because the core libraries in the JDK are built for everyone and might not be most, the most performant uh, way to do your particular application. And here again in the compile chains, the JDK version, the core library version, nope, couldn't be inlined. The customized version, yes, all of the different methods called within that were successfully inlined. So going back to call sites, um, Hotspot, when it's profiling your code, it counts the number of implementations it sees at a call site um, because too many implementations can make it too complicated to inline that method. Uh, if at runtime profiling, uh, the hotspot sees uh, only one implementation at a call site, that's known as monomorphic dispatch, and that's easy to inline. If it sees uh, two uh, different, different concrete implementations at a call site, say it sees the cat and the dog at the animal call site, um, it can actually inline both of those, and it just uses a very simple um, comparison and then jump to the correct um, air, the correct address in the inline code. It'll inline both of those bodies and have a little switch at the top to determine where to start executing from. Three or more, um, apart from a very specific set of circumstances I can't, I'm not going to cover here, uh, that's known as megamorphic and it's too complicated to dispatch. You're going to end up remaining with a virtual call. So here's a little example of a polymorphism test. Uh, you've got an interface called coin and you've got three implementations. You've got a nickel, uh, which adds five. You've got a dime, which adds 10. And you've got a quarter, which adds 25. And here's a little test and it um, uses a counter and a modulo on that counter. Um, so if maximum implementations is two, then this method here, um, coin.deposit, 
at the interface call site is only going to be using nickels and dimes. If it's three, then it'll be using all three. And you can see here in JitWatch's trial view at the coin.deposit call site invoke interface, you're seeing both the dime and the nickel have been inlined and the dime is adding five, the nickel is adding 10. And this is showing you, yes, bimorphic inlining happened successfully. Both of these were inlined. Whereas if you're using three implementations, you're now doing um, megamorphic uh, dispatch at this call site, virtual call not inlined. And you can see in the assembly, you're seeing a, uh, a call um, um, invocation happening in, in, the, in the native code. And again, here in the chain view, you're seeing virtual call this wasn't inlined, and because it wasn't inlined, you're going to miss out on the optimi on the on the gateway optimizations. So now we're going to move on to one of those gateway optimizations, and this is escape analysis, and this is a scope based a scope based optimization. Um, and you can with escape analysis, you can actually avoid allocating new objects on the heap if you can prove they don't escape a certain scope. Uh, this mess this um, technique can also be used uh, to reduce the number of locks in in code. So I've got an example here. This is a this is what's called a no escape. So this is the scope of the method, and within the loop we're cre we're creating a, a a my obj using the new keyword, and um, it's called foo. It's used within the loop. It doesn't escape the loop. It doesn't escape the method. This is called a no escape. Now this is called an arg escape. Um, what's happening is you're creating foo within the loop, but you're passing it as a parameter. So the ways that an object can escape scope are you pass it as a parameter somewhere else, you assign it to a static or an instance variable, um, or you return it from a method. With no escapes, um, the object is exploded. The JIT compiler basically looks at the object you've created and it goes, which fields of that object are actually used? And it, it says, I'll treat those fields as locals. Um, and then I'm going to give them to a part of the JVM called the register allocator, which decides where, they, where they're going to be stored. So rather than going on the heap, um, they can be stored in registers. If the registers are all being used, then they can be spilled onto the, onto the stack. Now, Avoiding allocations, allocations are actually quite cheap in the JVM, but um, the garbage collections which result from them, because eventually uh, when, when these objects do go out of scope, eventually they'll need to be cleaned up. Um, and it's the GC pauses which you're benefiting from avoiding when you're uh, benefiting from escape analysis. Here's a little test with an arg escape. So we've got two, we've got two objects here um, called escape tests. They've been created and we're passing one as a parameter to the other. Now, if this equals method can be inlined, and it's a very simple method, if these equals methods can be inlined, this, this object here, E2, no longer escapes. And um, running on the command line, you can see with escape analysis enabled and GC logging enabled, there were no garbage collections. Um, with uh, escape analysis disabled, which has kind of the same kind of effect as um, the method wasn't able to be inlined, uh, you can see these GCs. Now, that, that these aren't slow GCs, um, but they were clearing out 250 megabytes of garbage each uh, each time the GC was was um, executed. So in hot code, allocating, um, the, 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 the hotter the code, the more allocations will occur and um, the more you're going to have to clean up later sometime down the line. You're just pushing, you're, you're, you're allocating them quickly, but later down the line, you're going to have to clean them up. In JITWatch, um, if you see a strike through on a new, that will tell you that escape analysis has successfully uh, avoided allocating these objects on the heap. Uh, branch prediction. So one of the things that the JIT can do is try and predict branches. So here's a piece of code um, where we're using a random next Boolean and incrementing either A or B, depending on um, the, a, a random value. JITWatch can tell you, uh, it can warn you if an unpredictable branch was uh, encountered. So here we can see the branch was taken with a probability of just over a half. That's a very unpredictable branch. Um, so a speculative optimization uh, probably wouldn't be uh, very successful there. And you can also hover over any branch uh, bytecode. So if EQ, if GT, if LE, any of those um, conditional bytecodes, it will tell you the probability that that's taken. Um, intrinsics I mentioned. Uh, now, an intrinsic is a hand-rolled, um, customized version for a specific architecture. 
So if you're on um, Intel, it'll be uh, there'll be Intel intrinsics for the Intel JVM. There'll be ARM intrinsics for the ARM JVM. Um, and those are used in places where the uh, the, the, the optimum implementation of a method is well known for a specific architecture. So it might be maths functions like um, finding the sign of a number or the, the minimax of two numbers or um, bulk copying data from one memory address to another, um, things like that, and, uh, such, such as an array copy. Uh, as of JDK 20, there are 393 different uh, intrinsics supported by the uh, JVM. Um, and there's another tool on the website to, to dive into them if, you, if you're really interested. Here's an example of math.log10, which takes a double. Um, that actually uh, is boils down to two different instructions on the Intel uh, CPU. So JITWatch can tell you what your most used intrinsics, and you go, oh, this is great. Um, uh, array copy intrinsic was used uh, lots of times, which means all my array copies were fast. But what you, what you might want to be thinking is, well, why was I doing so many array copies? Uh, one reason might be you're using a lot of array lists and you're not pre-sizing them. So you're actually um, putting a large number of items into an array list um, and that array list has to resize, 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 resize. And each time it resizes, you have to create the new object and array copy all the old items into the new, uh, into the new collection. So if you do see a lot of array copies coming up in an intrinsics count, um, maybe track down where they're coming from. Could uh, pre-sizing your collections uh, be a benefit? Stale tasks. Um, so yes, you, you can you can queue up lots of things to be JIT compiled, but actually maybe they triggered a JIT comp they triggered a uh, they triggered the JIT and were entered into the compilation queue, but by the time they get to the head of the queue, uh, the JIT compiler will go, well hang on a minute, you haven't used this any you haven't used this since you queued it. I'm just going to treat this as a stale task, throw it away. I'm not going to spend time compiling that and using my code cache space. Um, I'm going to finish with a, a nice little example. This is from my article in Java Magazine. Vectorization. This shows you just how powerful the JIT can be in uh, in optimizing your code. So uh, here's a very simple method, uh, increment array. It takes an array of ints. It also takes a constant. And what it does is it, go, it visits every element in the array and it increments it by that constant. So at the source code level, it takes... Um, one, you, you're, you're doing one loop iteration for the for every um, item in the array. Looking at the bytecode, it's a it's a completely faithful representation of what the source code says. So we're just looping through, and we are incrementing one array location per loop. Um, but the JIT can do better. What we're seeing here is uh, the use of um, the, the wide registers on your CPU. On your Intel CPU, these are AVX2 uh, instructions uh, that are using a 256-bit wide register. Um, you can identify that used by the XMM and YMM prefixes. Um, so in Java, an int is 32 bits, and you can fit eight of them in one of these 256-bit wide registers. So this, this is what's happening. You're taking the constant to be added, and you're cloning it eight times across one of these wide registers. And now what you're doing is you're doing a packed integer addition, which is a uh, uh, an operation supported on uh, on modern Intel processors. And what's that? What that's doing is every time it's doing that operation, it's updating eight array locations. But it actually gets better than that. What's happening here is you're also benefiting from loop unrolling because here's the start of the loop, here's the branch back to the end of the loop. You are actually um, the JIT has said um, this is happening. You're, you're what the JIT said is you're not actually doing much per loop iteration. Um, so the overhead of doing the loop itself is quite expensive. So I'm going to unroll that loop. I'm going to count how many times things are happening in the loop, and I'm going to do multiple of them per loop iteration. And what's happened is it's unrolled that pair of instructions eight times. So instead of one array location being updated per loop iteration, you're actually getting 64 array, um, 64 items in the array are being updated every iteration of the loop. So summing up, JIT logs can reveal optimization issues. Um, 
you can find you can play with Jitwatch uh, to look at things in the sandbox, but you can also look at real world code and they can actually um, help you to highlight uh, a method that might have been highlighted in another tool such as async profiler or, or JFR. And you can really dive down into it, find out exactly what decisions the JIT made when it was processing that method, when it was optimizing it, when it optimized it, were there any problems optimizing it. Um, general piece of advice, keep your methods small for inlining. I like to use the head test, basically take the size of your head, take it up to your screen. If the method's bigger than that, you might have problems inlining it. Uh, check the inlineability of your third party libraries. You might be relying on libraries which are fantastic um, general purpose libraries, but could a domain specific version of that code help you with your performance? Um, check for unpredictable branches. Uh, one of the one of my favorite answers on Stack Overflow is the one about branch prediction. Um, and what, the, what that uh, shows is that um, given a, a completely unsorted array of numbers, a very large array, uh, if you if you iterate that loop and look at is one number bigger than the previous number, then the performance of that isn't great because if the numbers are random, then that's uh, that's pretty terrible. But by sorting that um, sorting that collection first, you are then processing them in ascending order, so the branches become uh, very very predictable, um, and that then there's a there's a, an insane performance gain uh, to be uh, uh, to be to, to be seen there. Now um, I'm not saying that's uh, that's available to everybody, but there are some circumstances where pre-processing a correct a collection before iteration can greatly improve the chances of successful optimization. Um, use appropriate method visibility. One of the techniques used by the JIT compiler is called class hierarchy analysis. Um, if the if the JIT knows that methods uh, can potentially be overridden, then you might have to be more cautious. If you are using private methods correctly, um, then uh, under normal circumstances, i.e. not reflection, uh, you'll know that those methods won't be overridden um, and the JIT might be able to make better optimizations based on that uh, assumption. Um, count your interface implementations. If you find you're using, uh, if you find you're using three at a call site, and a statistic I saw from uh, one of Doug Hawkins' uh, presentations was that 95% of call sites are monomorphic no, 90% of call sites are monomorphic, 5% are biomorphic, and the rest are megamorphic. But if you do happen to find an important call site is megamorphic, then there are things like um, instance of peels uh, and other tricks you can use to uh, to benefit from um, devirtualization and the de inlining gateway optimization. Uh, and check for allocations in your code. Um, don't allocate in hot code unless you're aware of the, the cost of that. Um, so I'm going to finish off uh, with a, a well-known quote in computer science. Uh, the bit in red is the part that everybody knows. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. People will say that to you, oh, you're optimizing too early. And for most of the time, they're right. The full quote is, we should forget about small efficiencies, say about 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil, yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%, because you might find, and it's true in a lot of programs, the hot code does represent a small percentage of the total code. And if you can make some changes to uh, help the JIT optimize that code to help you um, fully understand it, then then why not? Why give that up? And hopefully JITWatch is another tool that can help you there. So thanks very much for listening. Thanks for giving up an hour on this lovely Friday evening. Uh, JITWatch is free and open source. It's available on GitHub. Uh, it's under the Adopt Open JDK organization. Uh, some of my other JD, some of my other JVM tools are available on my website, Chris Who Codes, and, and that's who I'm on Twitter as well. If you want to follow me, so um, can I open up for any questions, please? We're getting lots of comments in the chat, which is really encouraging. Thank you so much, Chris. That was brilliant. Okay. All right, I'm um, going to open the chat up. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll bite maybe with a <laughs> real little <laughs> one. Um, so I'm kind of from the .NET background, actually, rather than JVM, where value objects have been a thing for well forever in that world. Uh, you mentioned uh, Project Valhalla earlier. Uh, do you think that will influence any of the techniques you talked about when that becomes I, I, Yes, I, ab absolutely, I think it will. Um, one of the things about value types is they don't have identity. So value types are, are objects without identity. And um, one of the one of, one of the areas where um, languages that do support value types, uh, effectively structs, um, can, can benefit is um, if you have uh, large collections of them, you have arrays of them, you have sort of predictable stride when you're iterating over them, um, they're, they're very CPU friendly. 
uh, and that's going to be the benefit when value types do make it into Java. Um, Project Valhalla is is very complicated. It's it's not it's never easy to to to, to backfit features into the JDK and the JVM. And Valhalla has been going on for quite a while, and it's got some of the some of the smartest minds working on it. Um, and it'll be fantastic um, if and when it does arrive. But it's it's uh, it's not an easy not an easy task to to to, to backfit uh, value types to the JD JVM. But I do predict uh, there'll be some um, significant performance improvements under certain applications when it does get in there. Okay. Um, right, let's Michael, see. go for it. Um, yeah, a um, question about polymorphism, megamorphism, yes. and particularly in in connection with um, I mean, as, an, as a typical example, using the collection types, hmm. um, we would normally um, try to avoid committing the code to a particular collection implementation. We'd use a generic list. Um, does that mean that um, everything is going to be megamorphic if you use general lists rather than? Uh, no, no, no. If you're if you're programming to, if you're programming to interfaces and you declare a Java util list on the left hand side uh, and you instantiate as a as a Java util array list, um, then unless you switch the type at um, during execution, um, that call site will be mon will be monomorphic uh, because uh, as as the profile is built, only the the array list will be will be observed at the at the call site. It's really if you're perhaps you've got a collection of the uh, of the interface type um, and you're iterating that collection of the interface type type calling um, uh, an interface method on a variety of concrete types um, where that method that where that method call site will become mon uh, megamorphic so even though it can't work out statically what the type is it, it monitors it dynamically and it says he's always using array lists oh, yes i mean the the, the um under uh, the C2 compiler um, does the uh, does does the type profiling. Um, so C2 builds um, counts of. Um, I mean, the, the the profiling is quite extensive. Every single bytecode is profiled, um, and at the uh, at the, uh, the the method dispatch bytecodes, there'll be counters for how many types are observed and which types were observed. So the when C2 optimizes that method, it will look at the profile for that call site and determine whether or not it can it can do an inline. Great. Thanks. Okay. I think there's a question there. Um, yeah, he's going to try and unmute to ask, but his audio might be a bit iffy because he's outside. So give okay. it a go, David. Uh, yeah, I could try that. Uh, can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Yep. Great, 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 great. Um, yeah, sorry, naive one. Um, so just how much of an improvement does the JIT give you, you know, with C1 and C2? And I realise it, it obviously depends on the code, but... Um, uh, you know, over what AOT can do. I mean, how how optimized and how aggressive can the can the JIT compiler be? Well, th this is my favourite answer, and it's it depends. But um, no, um, seriously, <laughs> um, seriously, uh, the one of the advantages of uh, of of JIT over AOT is it can optimize adaptively depending on different input data uh, and and different runs of the program. So. Uh, different optimizations can happen depending on what the input data looks like on a, on a given day. For the for the exact same implementation, you may find that the AOT is able to um, to come close or, or or maybe even exceed when you take into account the the time taken to profile, uh, warm up, and uh, and optimize that code. You might find that native implementations, uh, AOT compilations, do actually win out. Um, where I see JIT um, having a main benefit is the flexibility it gives you at runtime under different input data scenarios, which is something you can't really get from AOT. Now, with AOT, you can actually tune AOT with with PGO, with profile guided optimization, you can actually um, run your native image code, collect a profile as you're running, and then feed that profile back into a recompilation and get a, a more optimized native image. And 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 how close that is to uh, what a runtime JIT will give you is is worth measuring. I mean, again, everyone everyone should be measuring their um uh, their own particular application. But no, it's a really good question. It's a really good question, and it's something the Graal VM team are probably uh, experts at. So, so are there any you know any kind of like uh, links that you could point us to then in that direction to say? I, you yeah, know... I mean, I, I would I'd probably say um, the the tech blogs on the on the Graal VM website um, and, okay. and reach out reach out to any of the Graal VM team on Twitter, and and I'm sure they'll be happy to uh, to answer and, and promote their technology. Thanks, Chris. Excellent. Any other questions for Chris?
No. Okay. I would take that as a no. No, that, that, that's fine. I mean, um, you can reach out to me on Twitter at any time. Um, uh, or if you, if you got a, if you if you want to uh, use uh, use one of my open source tools, they're all on GitHub, uh, and you can raise an issue if you think there's a feature that would um, that, that, that you that you'd like to see in in one of those tools. So yeah, I'm 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 an open source kind of person, so I'm quite contactable. Fantastic. So all that is left for me to say then is thank you so much, Chris, for coming and sharing what you know and um, giving us some really amazing information there um, and thank you everybody else for joining us this evening if you want the recording it will be available from our youtube channel in the next few days so probably middle of next week you could see it there or uh, ping me a message on linkedin and i'll be able to send you the link when we know it's ready for you so other than that have a fantastic weekend and we look forward to seeing you at our next ljc event thanks so much for your time take care thanks all Thanks. Bye. Bye.